Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Nano at Tech seminar series. Um, and uh, we have uh, Professor Venshan Kai here, who's our speaker for the day. Um, we would like to welcome you as well as our speaker this afternoon. And um, want to give a brief introduction to Professor Kai. Uh, Dr. Venshan Kai is a professor at the Electrical and Computer Engineering at Georgia Tech. He also has a joint appointment. Um, at the Material Science and Engineering Department. Um, he joined Georgia Tech in the year 2012, and prior to that, he was a postdoctoral fellow at the Stanford University. And he received his uh, both bachelor's and master's degree from Tsinghua University um, in the year 2000 and 2002, respectively. Followed by that, um, he, he came to the US, um, and at the Purdue University, he received his PhD in the year 2008. His research is pretty much focused on uh, nanophotonic materials and devices, basically, um, you know, in, in which he made major impacts on the evolving field of plastics and metamaterials, specifically. And uh, Dr. Kai has published uh, approximately about 70 journal articles, um, and uh, he also authored a book titled uh, Optical Metamaterials, Fundamentals and Applications. Uh, Dr. Kai is a recipient of several distinctions and awards, and including a uh, um, OSA and SPY, uh, Joseph Goodman Book Writing Award, and the Office of Naval Research and Investigator Award. And so it's my pleasure to invite my colleague, uh, Venshan Kai, to speak on this topic, Field and Career Facilitated Nonlinear Nano Optics. Dr. Kai. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, it's really happy. My pleasure to see at least the common people in this audience. Actually, this is the very first time that we have this in-person presentation or lecture in the past year and a half. So I hope it is a good start point. And also because we don't have too many people in this audience in the room, so feel free to grab a lunch, okay? Because we can stay uh, away from each other and the enjoy the life, the lunch relatively safely. And I do know that uh, we have other students in the virtual space through this live broadcasting. In today's uh, lecture, I'm going to share with you our recent work on active control uh, of photonic systems, especially in the non-optical regime, facilitated by the applied field or the charge transfer. Okay. So I understand not many people, I think not everyone in the office, in the audience is uh, familiar with uh, this uh, nano optics or non optics or optics at all. So I think to start with, I'm going to just explain to you almost each and every word in this title. Okay, so field means electric field. We all know this, so you apply voltage across a gap, then B over D is an electric field. And also, light wave is an inact wave, so it has an electric field component. Okay, carrier. Carrier means charge carriers, electrons and holes. And the facilitator, as everyone knows, is a verb. And then the major three keywords, optics. One step further, the small scale optics, so the nonlinear optics, nano optics, and then nonlinear optics. Okay, so what does this mean? Optics is the study of uh, light and also light mass interaction along with related applications. Even from a quality physics class, you know there are different levels or different ways to describe optics. At the very beginning, you can use geometric optics to describe, for example, uh, the imaging property of a microscope, telescope, your eye glasses, and so on, just to analyze the bending of the light or reflection of light at interfaces, right? So that's geometric optics. And then there's a much more powerful thing, method we can use to describe light and the light mass interaction is called wave optics. Because light is a wave. Especially it's electromagnetic like wave within certain wavelength range or frequency range. Wavelengths from a fraction of a nanometer of a micrometer to a few micrometers. That is where we define the light frequency. Okay. For example, here you can see you can just make use of Maxwell's equation along with boundary conditions, you can explain things like uh, this tiny resonator coupled to a waveguide, things like that. And then at a very complicated level, you can also use the quantum optics, which is a part of electron quantum QED quantum electrodynamics, to describe the light mass interaction where you have to consider the basic 
so long as the possible packet of energy carried by light, so called photons. I think we know this from quantum physics part, part of duality and so on, which uh, the light has the smallest possible energy packet, so called h nu, okay, on constant times so of the frequency of light, okay, so called photon energy. The standard example is, uh, for example, uh, photoelectric effect. If frequency of light or photo energy of light is large enough, then uh, we can kick out the electrons from the metal to you. Enable, for example, charge transfer, charge propagation, and so on. So, optics or light matter interaction is enormously important for not only scientific research but for everyday life. Sometimes even more than you realize. Here, I just give you a few examples. For example, for someone who is almost blind without eyeglasses, certainly we need this device. Yeah, and also if these days you are brave enough to go to a movie theater, then maybe you want to put on the 3D uh, Google, basically, that help you to see uh, circular polarization of the light. So the right hand, right, your right eye and the left eye, you'll see the two circular polarizations of light. So you are going to have two sets of images, slightly offset, to give you those three-dimensional perception. Okay, optical disk, the uh, bits, the pit and the length that you uh, record the binary information of and zeros. And for many students, I think, you are watching this uh, lecture through the internet, and the internet is largely enabled by optical fiber communication, okay? The information is carried in terms of uh, optical signals high, low, or one and zero to propagate over very long distance. Very, very long distance across the ocean, for example. And we also know that, okay, light or light absorption, like converting into electricity, is one of the best hopes for renewable clean energy, so called so, so the chips. And also from a single computer, you can see many, many different parts and components related to optics. Not to say illumination is all about optics, even for medical applications like the LASX surgery. And many other uh, biomedical applications. Even for computer chips, although we all consider computer chips as electronic or IC integrated uh, uh, circuit device, actually as not be enabled by the optics. You need to do very complicated uh, multi steps of uh, photolithography using systems similar but more complicated than those how in this building, I think, to make very small features in the for electronics, okay. So these are just a few examples about the entire field of optics and its impact to human life. So optics, now it's simple, nano-optics. Nano-optics means the optics at the nanoscale. Or more rigorously, it means the behavior of the light at the sub scale, or the interaction of light with the micro-sized or nano-sized object. This is a relatively new research field because uh, the entire nanosubstance is relatively new. The development of nanophotonics, also for the nano optics, basically relies on not only the advances in theory and also the EMAP simulations, but more importantly, it relies on the advances in nanofabrication and nanocapitalization, which basically is what this IEN is about, right? So that is it was developed in the past 30, 40 years. That's why nano optics is relatively a new field. And there are a few major branches for nano optics. One is plasmonics, using structured metals to control light. And another one is metal materials, the periodic structure of uh, the, the structure is the union cell and their separation much smaller than the wavelength of light. This will give rise to the engineered uh, uh, optical behavior with a tailored optical response. And photonic crystals, which can provide things like a band gap for photons rather than electrons. So it's still photons similar to how conventional crystals influence electrons. Okay? And there are many applications in this research field. For example, uh, nanophotonics allow us to manipulate the flow of light at a wavelength scale, at, at a sub-wavelength scale, even beyond the conventional 
at this refraction limit, and also it allows us to achieve very unconventional exotic optical behavior not found in nature, for example. If you think about the refract index, it can be extremely large, it can be very, very small, even smaller than one, even smaller than zero, if you want, okay? And we can tailor the absorption of light and also the radiation pattern of light. And even more importantly, we can rely on nanophotonics to build a very small functional uh, components, for example, very tiny lasers, modulator detectors, and so on, to uh, eventually construct the so-called uh, integrated photonic circuits, and also that's enormously useful for optical imaging, sensing, and so on, at a very small footprint. And then now, the very last keyword, okay, nonlinear optics, because nonlinear nano optics means uh, the nano optics in the nonlinear domain. So, what is nonlinear optics? Nonlinear optics is an important branch of uh, optics in the so-called nonlinear domain. Also means uh, happens in nonlinear media. Okay, so what does it mean? It means the response is not proportional, proportional to the field magnitude itself. So when light or in general electromagnetic waves interact with certain materials, in the material it will have certain response. That response typically be described as using polarization field. In a textbook, that is a famous capital P. Okay? And in most materials, P is proportional to the electric field, E of the light. But in minor optical domain, P are not proportional to E anymore. They are additional or high order response. And then as a result, it will give rise to the possibility to produce a new frequency component and for the active control of light. Again, this normal optics, similar to optics in general, is a very useful for many different areas in scientific research, sometimes more than we realized. Here, I'll just give you a few examples. For example, if I'm using a green laser pointer, there was a green laser pointer. That's a green laser pointer out there. For some reason, the mouse control is not working. That is why I'm using this red one. Assume this is a green laser pointer, then actually it relies on uh, second harmonic generation of an infrared laser. In the laser cavity of this green laser pointer, there's a nonlinear crystal made of BBO or KDP, which produce the second harmonic generation. So basically, this internal laser, based on the material, the emission should be at uh, 1064 nanometer, and you know, then second harmonic of that reduce wavelength by a factor of two, that will give rise to 532, which is this very broad, bright green light, okay? This is really a very minor uh, application. Other applications, for example, optical modulator. You know that um, for the internet, for optical communications, you need to convert electrical signals to optical signals. Electrical signals are produced by your computer in the data center and so on, voltage levels of ones and zeros. And then how to convert these electrical signals to optical signals, the intensity high and the low. That relies on a very important uh, component, the so-called optical modulator. So optical modulator, this is a very typical configuration based on Maxender interferometer. The light split into two halves. One arm is a reference, the other arm, there's a special material in the other arm so that it's refractive index, and therefore the interfered output through the entire device can be controlled by the applied voltage signal. So this effect, refract index, or the phase delay of light is sensitive to the voltage. This is called the focus effect, which is, which is a second order nonlinear optical response. And then thanks to this nonlinear optical effect, focus effect, we can have a optical modulator that encode light with electrical signals that eventually enable the entire internet, optical communication systems, and so on, okay? Another example, many, many different type of optical parametric processes that give rise to almost any laser wavelength we want. Conventionally, without non optics, the laser frequency is related to electronic transition in the material itself. For example, you have a HINI as a gain material, then the wavelength is always 632.8 nanometer. You don't have much flexibility in changing that. It's governed by electronic transition intrinsic to the material. 
And with optical parametric processes, basically you can have rely on the harmonic generation, some frequency generation, difference frequency generation, and so on, to enable the laser emission at almost any wavelength you want. Okay, and optical frequency comb. Basically, it's a broadband emission with many, many spectral components evenly spaced. This optical comb can serve as a ruler for very precise measurement. So this is a major invention, I believe. There was a Nobel Prize behind that, or Nobel Prize in physics back in 2005, okay, optical comb. And the normal optics relies on and also produce laser pulses. Typically for the enhanced light matter interaction, you need relatively large instant intensity of light that relies on pulse lasers using Q-switching or more than not nowadays, okay, mode locking lasers. And also there's an there's entire field called ultra-fast optics that relies on non optics and also short laser pulses to study the material behavior and so on. So the non optics is also important for the generation of terahertz wave, terahertz wave. Frequency is on the order of one terahertz in the Emax spectrum, or the wavelength is on the order of, uh, say, uh, uh, a few micrometers or tens of micrometers, or hundreds of micrometers, and so on. This is a previously forgotten regime in the Emax spectrum, and now it's enormously used for, for both medical applications, for national security, and so on. Nano optics also give rise to better imaging behavior and so on, because typically when you have nonlinear optical regime uh, interaction, it's more precise, more localized, and also it can get into your even body tissue and so on. So that is why we can rely on two-fold excitation microscopy to see through your skin, see inside the tissue, and uh, another nonlinear optical response or big process that we use for fabrication is called two photopolymerization. This, I think, is a, it's because you have nonlinear, okay, two photo absorption, so that uh, only through this process can the polymer behavior be modified. Therefore, you can have this uh, three dimensional miniature, uh, almost like sculpture or any shape you want. This is made by, I think, uh, instrument housed in this building called the NanoScribe, yeah, okay. So we do have this in our clean room, thanks to the effort from our IEN in general. So I spent quite some time, you see, almost 10 or 15 minutes to cover the key word, okay. At this moment, I assume at least you know what's optics, why it's important, what's the nano-optics, what is nonlinear optics, okay. Now I'm going to go ahead with the, the more detailed uh, relatively new scientific research that uh, if you can understand that is good, otherwise, uh, at the very least, uh, use these two or three pages as the take home message. Okay, so in today's class, I'm going to, not class, lecture, I'm going to discuss externally induced non optical processes. Here you see, I believe that it's a very first uh, equation in any non optics textbook, which shows the induced polarization field in the material as a function of electric field component of the optical wave. The first term is really nothing, not nothing. The first field, uh, uh, the first uh, component here is a typical. Basically, it just gives rise to the regular refractive index. You see this chi one, one plus chi one with a square root is the refractive index of the material. So the second term is called the second order nonlinear optical processes. It's only possible in materials with, without inversion symmetry, okay? And the second order neuron effect is enormously important for us to generate a new laser component and for the active control uh, of light through processes like uh, Pockholz effect, uh, harmonic generation, some frequency generation, different frequency generation, and so on. The third term with the third order susceptibility, chi-3, uh, is called uh, third order non optical process, and uh, it's ubiquitous because everything has a non-zero chi-3 other than air, okay? Not like a chi-2. In later part of my uh, lecture, you will see 
we have to do a lot of trick in order to have non-zero chi-2 in materials. And for chi-3, it's always there, okay. And the chi-3 process is important for us to, say, generate four-wave mixing, hard, the, the, the third harmonic generation, uh, optical curry effect, uh, and so on. In particular, in the past couple of years, I have been focusing on two specific non-optical processes. One is uh, the electrically induced second order non-optical process. So basically in the material itself, there's no second order susceptibility. Chi-2 intrinsically is zero, as is for most materials. And now we can electrically induce a non-zero second order response in the material. And also I'm going to study or describe the hot carrier induced active control for light, which is a third order non-optical process, which can also be externally induced or controlled by the flow or dynamics of hot carriers. Okay. So this electrically induced second order non-optical process is not entirely new. People knew this even since 1960s or 1970s. So for example, electrically controlled second harmonic generation it's similar to the conventional second harmonic generation. It's a two second order nonlinear process, but rather than a two omega photon generated by omega plus omega, in this case, it's by omega plus omega plus zero. Zero means zero frequency. That means uh, it's, it's enabled or it can be influenced by an applied field, okay? And uh, there are many different configurations we can use to generate this uh, process, electrically induced harmonic generation. You can use a bulk crystal, some um, electrolyte or liquid environment, the depletion reading of a pin junction, some 2D crystals, and uh, some nanoplasmonic systems. Okay, I have a review article uh, like focus on this. Let me show you the very first example, which is electrically controlled second order nonlinear response from a single plasmonic cavity. So this plasmonic cavity that help you to condense light and then apply the voltage, and this controls the nonlinear behavior in a polymer represented by this purple thing, which is fused within this nano cavity. And then as a result, there's a very efficient tuning of the harmonic generation of light through this gap region um, by the applied voltage. So this is pretty old research, and not uh, as exactly 10 years ago, I think. Okay, and uh, now something new. Uh, so in this part, we are trying to uh, demonstrate the electric controlled harmonic generation of light from a metamaterial platform. Especially here, we have a metamaterial uh, so-called absorber, which you can see, okay, periodic metallic uh, uh, structures, the whole array in this case, separated by a backplane by a dielectric spacer. And then you apply a voltage to enable the effective chi 2 response and then that can control the harmonic generation from the entire system. So uh, such a configuration gives rise to a number of important uh, features that facilitate the so-called E-fish electric field induced harmonic generation of light. For example, this, electric, uh, this metallic structure simultaneously supports electric and optical functions. And uh, this metamaterial absorber can suck light from the external world and focus light into the dielectric space, which is certainly good because for almost all the non-optical interactions, the efficiency is proportional to the intensity of light. And also, there's a nanoscale gap around here. That means when you apply a certain voltage, there's an enormous static electric field in between. So here, from this optical and the uh, E-beam, Images, you can see, okay, this one is uh, uh, a chip with multiple devices. This is a zoomed view of a single device with electrical contact and uh, the central region of the patent area look like this one, okay. So from here, you can see the IEN and all our wonderful uh, fabrication and the nano characterization facility have been enormously useful for my research. Otherwise, it won't possible at all, okay. So the metamaterial um, absorber is uh, designed to have a perfect absorption band at around 820 nanometer, which is the center of our 
TSF laser. And uh, uh, from the simulation, you can see, okay, light is substantially enhanced in the cavity, basically by almost two orders of magnitude in terms of the intensity. In terms of field is one order of magnitude. You square that, it's two orders of magnitude. More importantly, by analyzing the components of light, you can see in the gap region, all the field, including applied field and the optical field are called linearly aligned along the Z direction, that's the direction perpendicular to the stacks. This is the preferred configuration for the efficient generation because in this case, we can make use of the most pronounced element in this chi 3 tensor. Okay, and uh, I believe I have to speed up because it, I spend too much time on the intro part to make sure that everyone at least can understand a few things <laughs> from my talk, okay. So here you can see, okay, even without applied field, you do see some harmonic generation from the system because um, there's always some surface effect. And more importantly, the conversion efficiency reached the peak level at around uh, 820 nanometers. This is precisely where there's a structure is designed to function. So we are going to fix the wavelength at this uh, excitation wavelengths and then use a voltage level to tune the harmonic generation of light from such a device. From both AC and the e DC control, you can see that uh, uh, the outgoing harmonic generation is proportional to the control voltage. And uh, this linear behavior results from, actually there's some theoretical analysis, actually in our system, that's both chi-3 and chi-2 induced by the surface structure, that is why the last term dominance, so we have this linear response. So other than solid state systems, the electric field harmonic, uh, controlled harmonic generation can also occur in uh, liquid environment, especially in some electrolyte. Because other than applying uh, voltage across a tiny gap, as you have seen in the previous demonstration, the strong electric field can also occur if there's a surface charge present on the metallic surface. This is a direct consequence of a boundary condition of Maxwell's equation, right? If you have a rho S, you are going to have a very strong D of normal around that surface, okay? So if you place the entire structure in the electrode and then apply a voltage, then the free ions in the liquid can flow towards and get accumulated on the metallic structure. This gives rise to very efficient electrical tuning of the non-optical output, which is potentially useful for uh, biochemical sensing and the signal generation or signal detection in liquid environment. So the lower electrode in our configuration is this uh, hexagonal array of plasmonic holes. It looks simple, but when you design the experiment, uh, there's a, a few very important considerations that you have to consider. So this structure is designed to have resonance enhanced the light intensity at the wavelength of interest in the, our case uh, around 850 or 850 nanometer in liquid solution. And uh, the structure itself is central symmetric. That means the background chi 2 response can be effectively suppressed. And more importantly, we need to make sure that in the metal, even for gold, the metal is not consumed for the pH value and the voltage that you use in the experiment. This is a pretty hard part because actually, even for gold, if you apply the more than positive two volt towards the electrode, the gold will disappear, dissolved into the water, okay? Certainly, we prefer to have a large area of contact between metal and the liquid along with a good amount of field enhancement that overlap with the ion accumulation when a voltage is applied, okay? So this is the major result from the experiment. Uh, basically, we apply the electric potential to the electrode, to this electrode, and see how the normal optical generation would be if affected by this behavior, because you know that this effective chi 2 response is enabled and therefore can be controlled by the electrical potential because the electrical potential affects the, the ion accumulation on the surface, okay? So if you put everything in the DI water, but it doesn't no voltage controlled variation in the harmonic generation because uh, 
there's no ions for the DI water, okay? For the electrolyte, for example, in this case, I think it's a potassium sulfate, okay? For each concentration, you can see the second harmonic signal varies parabolically with the applied voltage with the minimum occurring at about 0 0.3, which is a famous potential for zero charge for this electrolyte system. And uh, the tunability is pretty strong, actually. Amount of magnitude stronger than what we have seen in the solid state system, okay, more than 150% per volt in this uh, electrolyte solution. And also you see the change of the harmonic generation is uh, varying quadratically with the input intensity because it ascends the chi two response. And there's another piece of work I'm not going to discuss in details because it's almost like pure physics. It's uh, uh, pretty hard. Uh, at the very beginning of mathematical research in the non regime, there was a very famous uh, prediction, so-called backward phase matching, also called uh, uh, nonlinear mirror. That means the phase match, the harmonic generation will propagate not collinearly with the fundamental light, but rather towards the source of the fundamental light. A very exotic, unconventional behavior. And that was just a theoretical prediction until our demonstration a few years ago. So I'm not going to discuss the details, but the trick here is to enable effective chi 2 response by applying a voltage across a plasmonic waveguide channel. And more importantly, we can selectively enable or disable the uh, plasmonic resp or the normal response in selective part of the waveguide, which give us extremely uh, enjoyable flexibility in tailoring the normal optical response in different parts of the system. And uh, this electrically best uh, or electrically enabled chi two response is also possible in silicon. And we know silicon is important. It's simply the most important uh, material for. <laughs> for iron, I believe, okay, for electronics uh, industry, but also it's very important for photonics. Integrated circuits largely relies on silicon-based waveguide, uh, like uh, couplers and so on. And we do want to have the full function, including the dynamic tuning and so on, of silicon, which is very hard because silicon has a zero chi-3. Silicon has a crystal structure which is the same as a diamond which is the central symmetric. That means the chi-2 is simply zero, period. Okay, and how to enable the second order uh, normal optical response for the harmonic generation, for optical rectification, for Pocos effect, and so on, in a silicon platform. That's a possibility, okay, you have the silicon. If you want to enlarge the, the, the signal, then, okay, you can also make them into a resonator, in this case, a mi resonator and then apply voltage along the silicon resonators. This will make them a very efficient nonlinear optical resonators. And uh, for example, we, we carefully design that and also fabricate that so that at uh, a particular wavelength, 780 in this case, you can see perfect uh, me resonating behavior to excite the magnetic dipole moment. There's another figure, you can see magnetic dipole moment represented by the circling, circulating electric field. And then when you vary the excitation wavelengths with the fixed intensity and see the harmonic generation from such a system, and indeed, they reach the maximum when you hit this resonance, me resonance, okay? And then in terms of modulation, without such a me resonance, for example, for the polarization without the excitation, of the mirror resonance, there's almost no tunability. And for the right wavelength together with the right excitation mode, you can see that the harmonic generation can be very sensitive to the applied voltage as represented by this red dot. So now I'm going to switch gear to another topic, which is optical Kerr effect for all optical modulation, enabled by hot electrons, okay? This is, uh, again, the standard, or uh, well, the very first equation for any nonlinear optics textbook. We discussed the first term, which is just related to the regular refractive index. The second term is uh, related to chi-2 response, okay? 
like harmonic generation, optical rectification, Pocos effect, uh, some frequency generation, different frequency generation, and so on. Now let's look at the third one. There are many like important results from this third order nonlinear optical process. One of the most important one is optical curve effect. Optical curve effect means uh, it can be viewed as a like a frequency mixing behavior without changing the frequency because omega plus omega minus omega is still omega. But this gives rise to a direct consequence that is refract index is sensitive to electric field magnitude square or the intensity of light. Okay, so the intensity sensitive refract index. And uh, there's a lot of major consequence from this optical curve effect. If there's only one beam involved, the optical curve effect can lead to self-focusing, self, self, uh, uh, self phase modulation or modulation instability. If two beams are controlled, uh, involved like this one, that's a strong beam and then a weak beam, then apparently the strong beam will change the refractive index of this medium, which can be filled by a weak beam, so-called probe beam, okay? So this gives rise to the so-called optical modulation because the behavior of this probe wave will be modulated by this strong wave. Metals has pretty large chi-3 response, therefore plasmonic structures making use of metals can be, uh, can give rise to pretty good modulation depth along with relatively low energy, energy consumption. But on the other hand, the metals also have pretty large thermal loading. That means the recovery of the property back to the unexcited state can take very long time, picosecond or even longer. Uh, let me just use another page to introduce to you the dynamics of electrons during this light matter interaction, interaction of light with the metal. We all know that the metals can absorb light, especially when certain plasmonic resonance occurs, and then the incoming photons can be grabbed by the metallic structure, and then the energy can be transferred to the photon, or to the electrons. So let's take a close look at the time evolution. At the very beginning, okay, photons are absorbed, so uh, some electrons gain this energy of H and nu, the photon energy, and then they can reach the energy from the Fermi level, that's the initial maximum level of electric energy, to Fermi level EF plus photon energy. So this happens uh, very fast through the process of so-called Landau damping within 100 femtoseconds. So in this case, you have energetic electrons. And then in the next about a few hundred micrometers, the energetic electrons will exchange energy with the rest of the electrons and eventually all the electrons will reach the equilibrium, temporal equilibrium at an elevated temperature. Okay, so they follow the Fermi distribution, but at a higher uh, 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 temperature. So in this case, we say we have a cluster of hot electrons. So that is through electron-electron scattering. Given even longer time, the electron will exchange energy with the, with the lattice through electron phonon scattering. So now electron will further lower its temperature and increase the lattice temperature through this so-called internal thermalization. And eventually, using nanosecond or even longer, the entire system will reach back to equilibrium with the environment, okay? So this electron dynamics is very important for different application of hot carriers. Depending on your application, for, for example, many applications in photochemistry, we need to make use of the energetic electrons immediately after the Landau damping, even before a well-defined hot electron is produced. And on the other hand, for many heat-related applications, the uh, uh, thermal, uh, the, the temporal response is not important at all. And uh, for the optical modulation of the metallic property, for all optical modulation, itself can be relatively slow because as I said, it takes a picosecond or even longer for electron to reach equilibrium with phonons through electron phonon scattering. One way for us to suppress this electron phonon scattering and uh, speed up the response is to 
form a shock free junction. For example, the metal metallic structure is placed next to an electron uh, uh, electron absorber, which is some type of semiconductor, and with a shock free junction in between. In this case, we produce a one additional channel for electron to escape. Electron in the metal doesn't have to exchange their, their energy with, uh, with the lattice in the metal. Instead, they can get expelled or climb over the mountain and then reach the semiconductor. This process can be much faster than the intrinsically slow electron phonon scattering. So some general design principles, so basically we need to make sure that there's a very efficient uh, generation of hot carriers in the metal side and uh, the junction in between, between the metal and uh, the electron absorber or acceptor would be, should be appropriate so that uh, a good amount of electron can escape because of the, uh, the transfer probability is related to the junction height which is related to the relative magnitude of electron affinity in the metal and that of the semiconductor. And in the acceptor material, we need to make sure that the sufficient electron density of state allowed along with the right energy lineup, okay. So the first demonstration we are going to look at here is optical modulation of light using hot electrons. Uh, so in this case, if you have this uh, almost like a plasmonic absorber with metallic cubes separated from a gold uh, by a ITO layer, then you can do the following things. First, this ITO layer serves both as a spacer and also a very good electron absorber so that the hot electron generated in these cubes can escape from the metal and enter this ITO layer. And uh, so when certain plasmonic resonance occurs, the hot electron can be generated and whether or not it escapes into this ITO, the electron temperature and eventually phonon temperature can increase in the metallic particle, which can have an impact on the dielectric function of a metal. This can be seen from even the Jude model where both the plasmonic frequency and the damping factor are related to the, the temperature of the electrons and the temperature of the phonons, okay? So the device structure support two resonance mode. One is at a longer wavelength fabric polar mode, which is related to the geometry in most of the case, and another mode related to the lattice, so-called the lattice plasma mode. And this LP mode can be excited only by the TM polarized light, and it's featured with this very sharp resonance behavior. This is good because this means this, uh, the plasma resonance here has a, a sub radiant nature. It means that the radiative loss is very small so that all the incoming photons will be absorbed and almost all converted into hot electrons. So the optical modulation of the light intensity is characterized by using a pump probe three scheme. We have a broadband probe light and then we are going to shoot the pump light onto the structure which modify the electron distribution and then the probe light will fill the structure and then the change in the probe light is characterized by the transient reflection mapping. Then we vary the time delay and also uh, using a broadband probe light. So it's modified by this one, okay, delta OD, the change in the optical density. And you can see that in this case, uh, indeed, the reflection of light from this entire device, which also translates to absorption of light, can be modified by the pump light. And this horizontal axis is uh, the wavelength of the probe light, the vertical one is the OD. And you can see it's particularly pronounced when you hit the resonance. Oh, by the way, we have two uh, samples. One is based on gold and ITO, which facilitates the hot electron generation and the transfer. The other one is uh, the gold and uh, alumina, aluminum oxide is used to replace ITO. In this case, uh, they are not going to allow electron transfer because the shock junction will be extremely large. Okay, so the linear optical response is pretty much similar. So any response in the dynamic transient domain can be attributed to the material difference. Okay, from this normal mapping, you can see the modulation is pretty pronounced on the, at the resonance. So now we do the vertical cutting and see how the change 
in the optical behavior would be sensitive to the uh, time de delay. And you can see that in the good IT system with hot election generation and transport, the modulation is very large. If you translate it's data OD back to the reflection, the change is more than 80%. It happens within tens of or no more than 200 femtosecond, and then it's gradually recovered. Okay, that's a very fast component which is related to hot electron transport and a slow component which is related to the electron phonon interaction inside the metal because electrons, hot electrons are generated in the gold. A portion of them can escape from the gold and enter ITO very fast in a very small time window. And then for the rest, the experience is a very slow process. In the control experiment where the ITO is replaced by alumina with a huge shock V junction, so no electron can enter the alumina. You can see the modulation is much slower and also much weaker because you don't have this faster response at all. And uh, let's skip this part because, I mean, this page is related to the interband and the intraband transition of a metal, and it gives rise to a different response in terms of time domain and spectral domain. And other than the intensity modulation, the hot electron dynamics can also help us to enable this polarization and the phase modulation of light because you know phase is related to the refract index, which similar to conventional optical curve effect, uh, we can use metal along with the hot electron transport to modify that. Let me just show you one selective result, okay? So with the hot electron transport, Without I mean, hot electron generation, basically it's a output is a linearly polarized light. With hot electron transport, within about 200 femtoseconds, the polarization of light is modified substantially, and within about one picosecond, it goes back to the initial uh, status. And without hot electron transport, the response would be much, much slower, and also much, much lower, but much, much weaker, okay. And now, for the next, uh, I have only like almost five minutes left, so I'm going to skip a lot of slides just to give you some very quick flavor about how it looks like. We can also use uh, the hot electron to enable second order non optical response. Basically, your material initially with a zero chi 2 response, and uh, now we temporarily use hot electron to convert that into an effective second order non media and then modify the harmonic generation and optical like uh, rectification and so on in the structure. So this is uh, uh, more like uh, more details are described in this paper. And you can see that we have plasmonic structure and uh, then this white thing or substrate like thing is the uh, titanium oxide, which is amorphous with the zero chi two. But when plasmonic resonance occurs, then this asymmetric profile, physical profile of this uh, plasmonic particle will give rise to the hot electron injection roughly following this profile and the electron injection now enters the uh, titanium oxide. So within a very short period, within a very short time window, we are going to convert this amorphous titanium oxide layer initially with zero chi 2, convert that into uh, effective chi 2 material that uh, enlarge the frequency doubled output from this uh, structure. And indeed from our both theoretical analysis and also experimental demonstration, we can see it's a very efficient, very effective. And uh, this is the very first time that you can use another optical light, post light or CW light, to convert a regular material into a normal optical media in the second type. And this conversion can be done, as I said, in this plasmonic systems. If you want, you can also do that in two-dimensional materials because the light can be used to enable the photo excitation of some electrons. So you are going to use the light to saturate some electron transition, therefore selectively enable or disable certain uh, transition in the second order response of this uh, monolayer like a uh, transition metal dichlorodenide. Okay, so I believe the time is up, so I'm going to just quickly summarize. 
So I believe I have convinced you that a certain plasmonic or photonic structures in general can be viewed as a self-contained dynamic electro-optical system with both uh, electric and optical functions. And such electrically active structure can enable a wide range of neural optical processes uh, facilitated by applied electric signals or the charge carriers, okay? And we also see that optical property of metals can be modified in a transient manner that give us the opportunity to control the optical behavior of a system in a very fast or transient uh, fashion. And also we can, using all optical manner to enable the second order non-optical response in initially static or conventional semiconductor. Okay, I would like to thank my collaborators both on and off this campus, including Dr. Adibi on this campus, Tim Lian, not in our, on our campus, but in this city, in Emory, and also Professor Mark Brungas at Stanford and Xiaofeng Chen at Texas A&M. And these are the students who were heavily involved in the research in the past and also sometimes uh, some of them are still in my group, okay. As for the funding sources, of course, NSF, not just to support my individual research program, but also support this IEN. That will make my research possible. And also I acknowledge the funding source from like uh, our Air Force, Samsung, and OPE. That's all, thank you very much for your attention and uh, I would like to take any question you may have, thank you. Yes. Well, when you say that the optic, the property of the, the metal can be affected by the... Uh, by hot electrons, for example, yes. By the optic of the metal, the metal film, how will that have the... Metal is not a transparent film. Excuse me. No, metal is not transparent, but... Uh, uh, that is, I think, the beautiful idea behind the, all these uh, nanophotonics. Many parts of nanophotonics, we do rely on metal, okay? We do rely on metal. If you use a piece of metal, just a uniform piece of metal, that's really nothing important because it's just uh, like a mirror. But if we purposely structure metal into functional devices, either as individual components or as periodic structures, Metal are not, you can't really say it's opaque or not opaque or transparent. It can be transparent, it can be opaque, and you can also purposely design uh, resonance behaviors that you control light, to absorb light, and so on. Yes, thank you. Any other questions? I don't think we can answer questions from the virtual space. So, any questions from the lecture room audience? Okay, uh, for example, in optical signal processing and optical communications. Okay, certainly each like uh, signal channel has a dedicated wavelength. And sometimes you want to say that's a data series of 1001. Okay, previously carried by lambda one, and you want another wavelength, okay, load another wavelength, lambda two, with this digital signal 1001. So then you can do this, okay, this is the lambda two, you have lambda one carrying the 1001, and then there's a lambda one, you modify the optical property of your, for example, optical curve material. And then this lambda two will feel the change so that the data is now converted from lambda one to lambda two. It's just a one layman's explanation about optical modulation. Oh, okay, you mean the, okay, when I talk about the two-dimensional structures, right? Why the wavelength kind of uh, reduces as you move down the various levels of excitons? Oh, it's just, I think, as a definition thing, okay? okay. There are different uh, excitons available in, yeah, in like, uh, like those TMD, in my case, I think MOS2, okay? And uh, there are, I think, within the visible spectrum, there are three. The important message is that whenever you can, match 
one of the excitonic transition, the uh, normal optical response can be enlarged because uh, from the theoretical model, you can see the chi response is related to the transition probability of those things. Yeah, very good question. Thank you. Thank you very much, thank you.